Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. We're so glad to have you. This is our third in our six-part series of Thrive in Madison School District. And once again, um, we welcome everyone who's here. Just a reminder, we do record all of these on YouTube. So if you want to watch us later, we're to join us. I'm Dr. Michelle Wilson. I work in uh, the Tolleson Union High School District here um, in the Student Services Department, and I'd like to introduce the Director of Student Services, who's also here this evening, Edie Dee Dolan. You want to say a few words, Edie? Sure. I'm Edie Dolan. I'm the Director of Student Services in Madison. We're so pleased to welcome all of our Madison families and all of our visitors. And Thank you so much for being here with our special guests, Phyllis Fagel and Katie McPherson. Thank you, Edie. And Edie and I will log off just um, because um, our moderator, who I'm going to introduce in uh, just a minute, will take over the program and then we'll log on uh, just again at the very end of the program. So I'm going to introduce our moderator and our guest is here. Uh, she's also actually she's actually in Washington, D.C. joining us um, and um, she's going to be hopping on in just a second. She was here and had to jump away, so she'll be she'll be right back. But I'm going to just take a minute and introduce our moderator. This is Katie McPherson. So for those of you who've been with us for the three-part series already, you recognize Katie, but for those of you joining us tonight, I just want to take a quick minute and give an introduction in case um, you're meeting her for the first time. Katie McPherson uh, brings experience in secondary school leadership, prevention, school uh, organizational change, and she was the secondary school teacher, guidance counselor, and K-12 administrator. Currently, Katie serves as the regional sales man manager and director of professional development for Bark for Schools. A Bark for Schools is an artificial intelligence app that pr has protected over 5 million children nationwide. And she's also a national public speaker on youth mental health and suicide prevention. Katie also serves as the town of Gilbert, um, Arizona, One Gilbert Youth Mental Health Task Force. And on that group, she serves as the chair. Now, when Katie's not doing this, uh, she is the mother of four beautiful daughters. And listen to these ages, uh, 13, 13, 14, and 15. So Katie, you want to take a minute and say hello to everybody? Yeah, thanks so much for being here tonight. I'm super excited for you to get to know my colleague and friend, Phyllis. Yes, and I just want to make sure Philip Phyllis is here um, with us. She was here just a second ago, and I don't see Phyllis on the screen. I should be here. Oh, you there you are. Oh, okay. Great. Now <laughs> I see you. Wonderful. Well, this is Phyllis Bagel, um, and Phyllis is going to be our guest here this evening and our expert. So, Phyllis, we're so glad to have you. Let me just take a minute and introduce you. You have a very impressive bio, and I know everybody's going to love hearing your advice this evening. Phyllis has worked in both public and private schools with students in grades K-12. She currently serves full-time as a school counselor in the Sheraton Schools in Washington, D.C. She provides therapy to children, teens, and adults also in private practice with the Chrysalis Group Incorporated. Phyllis is the author of Middle School Matters and also serves as a journalist. She's a frequent contributor to the Washington Post, focusing on counseling, parenting, and education, and writes the Career Confidential Weekly Advice column for PDK International, this is for educators, and also the Meaningful Middle column for the Association for Middle Le Level Educators. She's written for Psychology Today, Working Mother, Time, U.S. News and World Report, Your Team, and her ideas have been shared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, The New Yorker, The Boston Globe, The Chicago Tribune, and many other outlets. So Phyllis, we are glad to have you here in Madison here this evening in our Thrive with the focus this evening, really all about our students who are going from K-4, our K-4 schools, and making that transition to our middle schools in grades five through eight. So our parents are going to love to hear and our families are going to love to hear your um, advice this evening. And so I'm going to turn it over to Katie. And Katie, I know you've got uh, some housekeeping just on how parents can send in and families can send in questions to you. So we're, Edie and I are going to jump off and we'll be back on. Welcome. We're glad to have you here this evening. Thank you. 
Hi. Um, so we use an app called Slido, S-L-I-D-O. And in the YouTube link there, you'll see a number that you can put in. So if you go to slido.com and put the number in in the YouTube link, um, you can ask questions that way. So that helps us um, just filter questions and make sure the same question isn't asked a bunch of times. So we'll be using that app tonight um, and we'll hold questions until the end. Um, again, just so excited to have Phyllis here. So true confession, Phyllis and I have never met in person. <laughs> I started following Phyllis two years ago, more than two years ago on Twitter. She posts wonderful articles and all sorts of goodness there. And I just fell in love with her. I was like, this woman knows her stuff. So I was like, we got to bring her to Maxim for this series. So thank you so much for staying up late with us um, to be here. It's and my pleasure. Yeah, I just want to um, first and foremost talk about your wonderful book, Middle School Matters. Can you just tell us a little bit about the book and what, you know, really inspired you to write it and what maybe just a couple key takeaways from the book? Sure. So when I started counseling in a middle school, it was actually in the wake of having been at an elementary school and at a high school. And I figured I would know what I was doing because I had been in these other settings. And then I got to middle school and was just blown away by, by what a different species I was encountering and how everything I thought I knew really didn't apply. And then when I went looking for resources that I could use not only to help myself and to help the students, but to help the parents that I, who I was supporting, there was very little out there. And so I really wrote the book for myself, for parents, for kids, but also because I want parents to stay involved in this phase. And it can be extremely confusing to know how you can stay involved when it seems like your kids are pushing you away or don't seem to want to have you in the vicinity in the way that they did maybe even six months earlier. And they really do want parents just in a different way. Uh, so as you know, families are listening, caregivers, parents, um, one of my, you know, I have four, <laughs> four teenage or, you know, daughters that are in this 13 through 15 year old phase, right? Um, so I, I feel it as an educator and as a parent, um, come here, go away, because sometimes they are like literally latched on to me as like toddlers. And then they're completely like, please get out of my face, you're breathing. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about, you know, developing brain through those middle years from fourth through eighth grade, especially. And then also, you know, one of the things lately that I've been thinking about is you have the underdeveloped brain, but then you have these other brains that are maybe even overdeveloped in the sense of gifted, right? And so you have a lot of changes going on, not only hormonally, physically, but also in the brain. So if you could just give us maybe a backdrop of what that might look like, what it sounds like, and maybe some strategies to help. Sure. So as you're making that transition to fifth grade, you're just really starting that process of going through all of the hormonal changes that we're talking about. Some kids do go through puberty earlier, but for the most part, kids go into middle school and fifth grade very much like an elementary school student, but the changes start happening rapid fire. So you can have one kid who's playing with dolls and another kid who is ranking their crushes and experimenting with makeup. And at the same time, we have these kids whose academic difficulty ramps up. They have more classes, more homework, but because they are tweens, because they don't have this fully de developed brain with a fully functioning prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that is responsible for things like empathy and self-compassion and logical thinking and problem solving, there's this mismatch between what we're expecting of them and what they're capable of doing. Now, middle school educators know that and they do a lot of scaffolding to help them develop those skills. But I think for parents, something that is important to keep in mind, especially if you're worried when they make that transition because it seems like they're dropping a lot of balls, that ability to predict how your effort today is going to impact what you produce tomorrow doesn't even begin to kick in until about age 15. So their executive functioning skills are not fully developed. And then on top of that, you have all of those other changes, Katie, that you were talking about, that desire to fit in, that insecurity. They're suddenly so aware of how they stack up to other people. They're really vulnerable. Their amygdala or the part of their brain that is fight, flight, or freeze can go into overdrive if they feel threatened. And that can be threatened socially. It can be that they don't get a 
a spot on the team or something goes awry and it's really, really difficult for them to recover without some coaching and support in these years. And thinking about, you know, kind of that fight, flight, freeze. So in my experience at the school level, the freeze was the hardest for me to read when I didn't have the training. So often I think parents and caregivers and families are like, why is he shutting down? Or why is he looking away? Or why is he looking at the ceiling when I'm talking to him? Can you talk just a little bit about the freeze and maybe a strategy or two that might be better than the constant peppering of questions that we do? <laughs> that yes. actually makes the freeze. And I have, I have a 13 year old son, so I do understand. This is my third middle schooler. And I know exactly what you're talking about. And really, the, the key is not to wait until you think there's a problem to try to interact with them, to have lots of casual interactions with them. A middle schooler does not want you to have this big overreaction or to do what I call mining for misery or interviewing for pain. You know, are you okay? Are you okay? In fact, I had one middle schooler tell me that that is the absolute worst, most annoying question for either a parent or a teacher to ask because they're always going to lie. They're always going to say they're fine. And if they're not fine, they feel like they have then missed that opportunity to get help and it's hard to go back. So it's much better to try to find opportunities to talk to them when it doesn't feel loaded. So maybe when you're in the car driving to school or you're talking about something that isn't personal and middle schoolers tend to think that everything is personal. You can say, what did you learn today? And they won't answer. And if you shift it just a little bit and say, what did the teacher talk about? Maybe they will. So just recognizing that you may need a different way of entering into that space that doesn't feel intrusive. And on top of all of that, allow them some privacy. If they go in their room and shut the door more often, that's okay, that's normal, and they need that space. One of the things too that I've noticed with my own kids is after school, they are absolutely ravenous and they're so hungry. So like I've gotten totally away from like, how was your day, right? I just give them a lot of time to decompress, to come home, get that snack, get some water and just be, right? I mean, a lot of what goes on in middle and high school, especially is that jockeying for position in the social group, that true sense of belonging, the fitting in versus the belonging. There's just like so many moving parts, right? So I get a lot of questions from caregivers about, you know, he won't talk to me, he won't open up, I'm trying to figure out what the grades are. And, and I'm like, we've got to give a little bit of time. You know, they've just been through a really long day of people talking with them, at them, around them. Um, so any other thoughts around kind of that after school period to the night? Because we start looking at fifth through eighth grade, introducing phones for some of them, right? So you've got just a lot of moving parts. Yes, and I love what you said about the snacks because it's true. They're, they have this onslaught of interactions all day long and especially for kids who are on the more introverted side it's exhausting you're not only navigating those friend pieces but the interactions with teachers maybe you're taking a quiz maybe you're worried about how you'll appear if you answer a question in class who you're going to sit with at lunch all of that takes a lot of energy and so while as a caregiver you might want them to sit down right away and do their homework i think it's important to give them some choice Kids in this age group also really do well with some autonomy when they feel that sense of agency and to say, you know, tell me what you have to get done and let's figure out a schedule. You can help them with the time management, but it might make sense for them. I'm a big fan of having them play first, run around outside, get some fresh air, see their friends or talk to their friends if they want to. Some kids want to shut down. Others want to get right back online and socialize with their friends. Those social needs are everything right now in the age group, but also given everything that's happened and all the disruption in the last few years, we're seeing that these kids, everything that they do is really driven by those social needs. And on that note, um, just thinking about, you know, kids transitioning from fourth to fifth and then fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, um, you know, there's some talk about grades, right? So rigor goes up, relationships become stronger with teachers. We're starting to look at, you know, think about sixth through eighth grade. I'm in eighth grade, where am I gonna go to high school? So one of the things that our kind of space talks about a lot is the grade pool and that it was, you know, it's always been a communication tool. So I have found over the years, you know, on the administrative side of things and now on the parent side of things, you know, looking at grades and being like, oh my gosh, she 
bombed that test, right? And and that non-anxious presence of like, okay, you know, right when she walks through the door, like what happened in math today? You know, so can you talk a little bit about grades and then the communication tool of how we learn about grades and maybe some good approaches and just some things to remember, you know, fourth through 12th grade, especially as they start to take classes that maybe have higher stakes attached to them. So I would really view these years as a time for them to learn how they learn best, as opposed to focusing on the grades themselves. And we want them to be comfortable taking risks. It's hard enough if you feel that imaginary audience looking at you to raise your hand in class. I've had kids who have trouble even going to class if they're afraid that they're going to be called on. And so the higher the pressure, the worse they perform. And as tempting as it is to see something in that portal and to have that jolt of anxiety, I think we have to pause and caregivers have to say, first, you know, whose anxiety is this? And is this something that I've said before? Because when you pick them up and when you greet them, the first thing you want to say is, I'm so happy to see you and just welcome them into the car. Because if something didn't go well, it is going to be a blow to them too. And they're going to be looking to you for reassurance that you still love them just as they are, that that gap, and this is a quote from a developmental pediatrician, Dr. Ken Ginsberg, that I love. He says, the wider the gap between who a child is and who they think you need them to be, the more they'll struggle. So if you've always told them that what matters is that they work hard and they get in that car and they tell you, I got a C or I bombed this quiz and you tell them it's fine because you know they worked hard, but you just wait even a minute before you answer, all they're going to remember is that pause. And we know that middle schoolers misinterpret feedback about 40% of the time. So we want to make sure that the words we choose, the messages we're delivering, our body language, our tone, those pauses, our timing are all in alignment, or they're going to sniff out in that inauthenticity and they're not going to believe us and we want them to trust us so that they can tell us when they need help so again just like you said we can support them and help them figure out what they need to be successful the next time so that when the stakes are higher they have a good sense of what they need to do and on the front of you know that whole piece of mental health and feeling like i can trust my parents and come to them i mean certainly we've seen not just the last two years but well before the pandemic we were in you know what i would call a public health crisis for adults and youth um just thinking about mental health strategies so we're mid-march we in arizona end school memorial day right and then we go back very early august or for some of our districts it's mid July. So thinking about maybe having six to 12 weeks of summer coming up, um, what are some things that parents can do to kind of front load that mental health piece so that going into fifth through eighth grade is a little, you know, at least we have some things, some tools in our toolbox. So first, I think recognizing that the questions that they have about that transition to middle school might not be what we assume are their questions. I think we tend to go high level and think, oh, are they worried that they won't be able to manage the workload? Are they thinking about whether or not they will ultimately take this elective or that elective? And really what they're thinking are, about things are like Will I have enough time to go to the bathroom between classes? If there's a combination lock, how do you use it? Who will I sit with on the first day? What if nobody from my K-4 is in any of my classes? What will I do? And, and so on and so forth. And so I think in the summer, helping them get more comfortable with the transition, helping them maybe have an arrangement to meet a friend on that first day, either at lunch if they have the same schedule or after school, just so they know they have something familiar to look forward to can help. But in those intervening weeks, I think just let them be kids. There's no preparing academically for middle school that needs to be done. They can just read for pleasure. They can start to get a sense of what they do enjoy doing in their free time. And then when they get to middle school, maybe even experiment more and try different things. I love it. So one of the things that you talked about earlier and um, before we hopped on was this concept of having a best friend. So can you shed some light on what that looks like in fifth grade, what it looks like in eighth grade, what it looks like when you're 48, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I, I, I've been thinking a lot about this because more and more, I feel like fifth and sixth graders in particular over freight the importance of a best friend to their detriment because it is lose-lose often. If you put all of your eggs in that one basket and you just prioritize that one friend to the exclusion of others, 
if that friendship goes south, you're left in the lurch. And at the same time, all the other girls or boys who are milling around wanting to get in on that dyad are feeling left out or like a third wheel. So it doesn't work for the people who are in that situation or for the people who are floating around. We also know it's protective to have the ability to be a floater, to be able to move from one group to another, to have those social chameleon skills. And so what I've been telling caregivers to do is to really talk about the different role that different friends play in your life. Maybe you have one friend that you like to go jogging with and another friend who you call when you just want someone to make you laugh. Maybe they can't keep a secret to save their life, but they're really great at lifting your spirits. And then there's another one who you know won't judge you when you make a mistake and will help you problem solve. And maybe one more who is a childhood friend and you love to call them when you want to get nostalgic and reminisce about childhood experiences. And I think if we message it that way, as opposed to talking about our own best friends, we start to transmit that message that no one person is going to meet all of our needs. And that way, when they do have that turmoil, that churn that comes in middle school, and some of the statistics that I share with students that alarm parents, but are very reassuring to kids, and I'll explain why in a second, if you ask a middle schooler to name their best friend, only about half of those friends are going to name them back. In the first year of middle school, about 12% of kids have nobody named them as a friend. If you follow kids from seventh grade to 12th grade, only 1% of those friendships stay constant. And if you follow kids from the first, from the fall of sixth grade to the spring of sixth grade, this was research was done in more traditional sixth through eight middle schools. What you find is that only a third of those friendships stay constant and are consistent. And so while that sounds kind of awful and these friendships look so fragile to adults, they are incredibly validating to kids, especially when they have been like fired or dumped by friends, because what it really reinforces is that there is nothing inherently wrong with them. They're not lacking in some way. This is what happens. Everybody is gonna get dumped by a friend. Everybody is gonna feel that kind of heartbreak because this is exactly when you're doing that work to figure out what you need from a friend and what you can give to a friend. And if you don't do that work now, when you do get to be 48 or whatever age, then you might not make the best choices. Or when you're choosing a life partner, you might not make the best decision. Or if you're in a bad, work situation with an abusive supervisor, you might not have the skills to remove yourself. So we want to save them, but that doesn't necessarily help them in the long run. So much to unpack there. My goodness, friendships, right? Um, so thinking about caregivers and parents, I've had some parents over the years say like, I don't know, especially moms, like, I don't know where my place is because K through four, I was like the room parent. I was the PTO mom. And now that he or she's moving into these older grades, there's a little bit of pushback from my own child or maybe a perceived pushback, like we're good as a class. We just need help, like, we just need you to send in some stuff, but we don't need the copy mom anymore, right? So there's an article floating around there from years ago about, like, being a mom, like, as your middle schooler is going like this, you're also going through a transition as a woman, too. So just thinking about, like, all that anxiety um, that goes with being a caregiver in that space, can you just talk about, you know, how not to maybe personalize that so much? I think it's really hard not to take on our children's transitions as our own in a lot of ways. And this is a particularly difficult one, especially since kids, as you mentioned earlier, often start stop talking quite as much. It's harder to access their internal life. And you're right, the schools are not quite as welcoming. They do want their students to have a bit more freedom and a bit more autonomy and all of that is important. So it might look different but you can still get in that building. You might be helping to organize something for the teacher, or you might be getting involved in a fundraiser or dropping off something for a teacher appreciation day, or uh, it could be a career day. There might be career lunches or an opportunity to talk, but in terms of building your own community so that you feel like you're part of it, even if your child isn't necessarily welcoming you in with open arms, I think there are a lot of ways that schools and parents can partner. It could be a book club, where you're talking about 
an issue that lots of people are dealing with at the same time. It could be that they bring in a speaker and you go so that you have a chance to mingle with other parents. It could be a school event or your kids' sporting events. There are opportunities to get in there and to meet other parents. And I do recommend meeting other parents before your kids are in high school, especially if you don't know your child's par friend's parents. And as kids come home with some of those friendship struggles that you talked about, what's the best way to handle that? Like, do you just listen? Do you listen and strategize? Do you write it down? I think that is a was a huge learning for me, especially my girls are very verbal, probably too two verbal subjects. I'm like, oh my God, there's so many, so much going on. Um, so listening is an art, right? Um, so sometimes they don't want us to fix it. So what are some of your, what's your advisement on all things, you know, friendship struggles, classmates being jerks. I saw this online about myself, all things yuck. It's, it's so hard, especially when you as a parent can see it coming from a mile away and wish we could just you know, yank them out of the way and we can't. So the first thing you do is just listen and validate. Wow, I would feel embarrassed too if that happened to me or that sounds really hurtful. And before you jump in to offer help, ask them if they want help. Do you want me to just listen? Do you want me to help you come up with some solutions? The one thing that I think you can do in terms of coaching them that's really protective and will help them have a positive middle school experience overall is to get them in the habit of exercising some cognitive flexibility and assuming positive intent. So I call it the maybe game, but I will say to a student or a client or my own kid, I want you to come up with five alternative reasons why that friend left you out of the sleepover or why they got hung out after school without you, even though you're, they're your closest friends. And the key part is that you have to tell them, I don't need you to believe what you come up with, because they're not going to believe these alternative, more benign explanations in the moment, but you want to get them in the habit of not going straight to that worst case scenario. So maybe they all got together because they were at soccer practice and it just organically bled into hanging out. Or maybe one of the people in that group had thought that you had said that you were going to visit a grandparent for the weekend, or maybe they texted you and you didn't even see the text or there was one digit wrong. Doesn't matter what they come up with. I just want them to entertain the possibility that the answer to this situation is not everybody hates you, your life is over, you're a complete loser, you will never socialize again. Because that is something that is really, really hard for middle schoolers not to do. They don't have a really broad feelings vocabulary. And so they tend to go straight to that I'm really angry or I'm really embarrassed or I'm really depressed. So we can also help them build that vocabulary. If they say that they're depressed, and I'm actually thinking of a specific student who came in and said, you know, I'm sad all the time and I don't know why I'm sad. And I said to her, wow, I said, that first of all, validate, you know, that sounds terrible. But then I said, you know, when I'm talking to kids and they tell me how they feel, but they don't know why, sometimes it's because they haven't named the right feeling. Is it possible that maybe that you're feeling something different? And I even got out a feelings wheel, which is something you can Google and find. And we went through all of these different emotions and she got to the category that fell under her scared. And she's like, I think it's that category. And so then we drilled down and under the scared category was worried. And she said, ah, oh, that's it, I'm worried. And once we figured out that she was worried, we could actually get to the problem solving. So some of it is helping them assume positive intent, and some of it is simply helping them figure out what exactly is really at the root of the problem so that you can get to the problem solving. And then the third piece I would emphasize, and I'm thinking of all the students who come in, usually it's a group of about nine girls at once who all are coming to tell me that whatever catastrophe has happened, it's usually online. And it usually happened over the weekend. <laughs> it's, you know, it's a Monday morning thing. And the first thing I do is say, hold up, Tell me who is who are the two core people who are involved with this? Okay, you're here to support, but it, you have nothing to do with this. You weren't even on the group chat. Okay, go back to class. And that's something that we wanna be doing too because they could fight every battle, but we want them to conserve their energy. And so helping them figure out if this is actually their fight to have, and if it's even a battle that they want to wage so that we can get them out of that scrum and teach them to disengage because it does get overwhelming for them, even though middle schoolers have a reputation for wanting drama. 
Um, so let's talk about that word drama. (laughs) (laughs) So when, you know, I, I'm probably a little hypervigilant about people, you know, when people find out that I have four girls, they're like, oh, you know, were you just, you know, trying for the sun? And I'm like, no, actually, no, no, we were just trying for healthy babies. Right. Or, you know, the last two were twins. And I jokingly say like, you know, when they start coming in pairs, you need to be done. So they (laughs) marvel at like all this, you know, all this girlness in my house. Right. And they say things with great intentions about like, oh, there must be so much drama or are they all dramatic or who's your dramatic one? Or, you know, do you have a lot of mean girl problems? And so I, you know, I'm fine with that, but I do worry like when girls hear that they're mean girls or they're dramatic or, you know, you're just drama that we're kind of sending the wrong message about feelings. So can you speak just a little bit to moms and dads, you know, that are listening to maybe the same story loop 17 times, like what would be the strategy for a child that comes home and, you know, keeps talking about Chloe, keeps talking about cadence, like whatever it is, right. How do we get, not just girls, but boys too, to express themselves, but not allow them to, you know, keep going so much that they're ruminating and not getting over to like an actual pathway out of that. And well, to address your first point, I completely agree. And I do not actually think that girls are more drama seeking than boys. I work equally hard to settle things. They tend to fight about different things. Girls, it's more relational stuff. Boys, it often is that somebody assaulted their ability to do Mm -hmm. something, you know, they're not the best at whatever video game or sport. And so while the issues can be different, I don't find that one gender tends to struggle more than another. So the ruminating thing can also impact boys and girls, and it is exhausting to worry nonstop. I think we as adults would agree. And it's been a pretty worry filled year. I actually, I just looked I'm still at my school and I was just noticed out of the corner of my eye, this is my worry monster. And he, I have my younger, I got it for my younger students since I'm in a K-8 to write down their worries and feed it to the worry monster and they love it. But in the surprise, what I've discovered is that guess who loves it even more than my younger elementary school students? It's the middle schoolers. And I have a couple of theories for that. One is that Given the pandemic, everybody is presenting a little bit younger and wanting more nurturing. Normally, middle schoolers want you to talk to them as if they're a little bit older and more mature than they are. Right now, they want hugs, they want reassurance, and they want to feel cared for. And I think that that is part of it. But the other piece of it is that at any given time, a middle schooler can be 13 going on three or 13 going on 30. And so remembering that too, I think is important. As parents, caregivers at home, one of the things I'll do and model for my own 13 year old is that I will write down on a piece of paper, you know, something that's causing me stress. And I'll say, you know what, I'm putting this on ice. I need to take a break. And I will literally put it in my freezer because I do think we need to model for them that it is okay to set that worry aside. And we need to reinforce that there is no such thing as a shameful or a bad feeling. I think that sometimes can trip them up because they feel like they can't admit that they feel jealous or they can't admit that they feel full of rage, doesn't feel like a good person might feel that way. And so really let them know it's okay to feel that way. Feelings are involuntary. They have nothing to do with who they are as a person, but they can control what they do with those feelings. They can control whether they hurt somebody or whether they make a poor decision. Another way to help with that ruminating piece is to schedule time a couple times a week, worry, just worry time. You know, on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 4.30 to 4.45, we're at bedtime for five minutes. We're going to talk about this and then we're going to really make an effort to set it aside. Yeah, no, I need a worry monster. Where do I go? <laughs> Amazon. Literally, I was up the other night solving world problems and none of them got solved. <laughs> Um, so we've mentioned throughout, you know, online type behavior. So we could probably spend three days talking about when to get a phone, what's on the phone, what kind of apps, all of that. So I don't really want to, we did a session with Chris McKenna from, um, protect young eyes. So I don't want to spend too much time on that piece of it. Um, but just your take on how does this online world merge with the in-person world and how do we even, you know, just even at the the fifth grade level, 
you know, I believe that third through fifth grade parents are in like the sweetest of spots. And if they can adhere to some of your, your advisement and Chris McKenna's advisement, that seventh, eighth through 12th and beyond is a much easier road if we really hone in, you know, third through sixth grade on making those like really um, intentional decisions about how are we as a family or caregivers going to manage the use of these devices? Yeah, and I think you have to know your child. Something that I think isn't necessarily intuitive to caregivers is that once you give that phone, sometimes it feels like you have given the keys to the car and there's nothing you can do to take it back. And that's actually not true. And I think it's important to message that to your children, not in a way of shaming them, but to let them know that we're allowing you to use this phone as long as it you're using it in a way that is pro-social and not getting you into hot water. If it doesn't seem to be going well, we're going to coach you. And if it's still not going well, we're probably not going to allow you to use that phone for a little while. I think you have to be willing to take it away if it's really getting abused or you know, used in a way that's actually coming back to haunt them. And sometimes the way that might manifest and could be a boy or a girl, again, it doesn't matter the gender, is that they are perseverating or they are just lobbing text after text at a friend, their neediness is really overwhelming. And if somebody doesn't respond, they get really upset that they haven't responded. A child like that is really doesn't have the maturity to be managing those extra social interactions online. And it's all one in the same. Their interactions at school, their interactions after school, it all bleeds together. If it happens on the weekend, it ends up impacting what happens at school as well. And so helping them understand that they might be more prone to making poor decisions if they have that anonymity, if they're not looking someone in the eye. And some kids really do need as many cues as possible. It's not enough for them just to be operating online. So my favorite exercise to have a kid do once you give them a phone, go through all of, have them go through either all of their uh, texts. And if you're talking about like a sixth grader tends to be, you know, a 25 kid group text chain. If it's an older middle schooler, it might be snaps or Instagram and ask them to find the post or the text that really doesn't reflect either how they want to see themselves, how they want other people to see them, or maybe they just are kind of, it's kind of cringy, like they overexposed or they try too hard to impress instead of connect with someone or a joke fell flat, or maybe they lied and now they don't know how to rein it back in. And then once they found that post to really think about what was going on at that point in time, what were they thinking about? Were they tired? Was it in their bedroom? It almost never goes well to have that phone in the bedroom. Almost nothing good happens late at night either. Maybe they were jealous or angry and maybe they had one of those emotions that are really hard to cope with that they would have been better off talking about with their parents and, or caregiver instead of just lashing out online. And that way, if they can see what that what makes them vulnerable to making these poor decisions, they might be able to avoid making that same mistake again. So you mentioned lying. <laughs> so I remember when I was in the schools, you know, parents would be like, why did he lie to me? Like, look at these grades or, you know, they, he'd be in trouble for discipline and he would lie to me three times. And then finally we'd get to the truth. And then I'd say, you know, what's up, buddy, you know, and then cry. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so can you shed some light on lying in general between, you know, fifth and 12th grade, um, why do kids lie? And when they lie, what might a conversation around that be? Depending on obviously the situation, but just kind of this overall um, developmental phase that they're in. Yes, and I'll, I'm thinking about an example of, uh, this was not at my school, but it was at another school. There was a girl who skipped lunch to socialize because she wanted to see her friend. It was one of the few times of the day that she could do that. And they went out in the hall and they're walking around, they're having a great conversation, they're using the time the way they want, although they're not supposed to be out in the hall at that point in time. And you know, sure enough, a principal rounded the corner. And when they saw that there was a principal who had spied them, they ran away and they hid in the bathroom around the corner and waited what they thought would be you know, an acceptable amount of time that the principal would lose interest 
and walk away. And so they waited, 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 and they came outside and the principal was, you know, standing there, <laughs> arms crossed and the girls immediately burst into tears. And it's such like a classic example of the kind of, you know, quote unquote lie that a middle schooler would tell because what they were trying to avoid was getting in trouble. They weren't lying for no reason whatsoever. So a little kid is going to lie because maybe they have a fantasy or they're being creative or it's wishful thinking. If a middle schooler lies, they have something going on under the surface. They don't want to admit that they don't know what they're doing or they want to impress somebody or they want you, they know you're going to say no to them hanging out with that cool crowd that they want to be a part of. And so you have to be a bit of an anthropologist and a detective and figure out what it is that is getting in the way of them telling the truth. And then if you don't want them to lie again, <laughs> to give them a runway back to telling the truth. So you might say, I might say I did my homework when I didn't too, if I thought my parents would be mad at me or might not let me go online and play video games with my best friends. But, and then the next step is it's not okay and here's why. And then whatever the consequence or next step is for, for them. But I think it's really important that the lie and whatever it is that they did wrong are separated because you want to be teaching them to be honest and you want to be coming up with a logical or a logical consequence for whatever it is that they did that broke your rules if that makes sense yeah no so i that's so um it's so complex sometimes right but so easy at the same time <laughs> we get all worked up ourselves right we're in our fight flight freeze sometimes. Like I call it in our house, it's downstairs brain. Like I'm in my downstairs brain. Mm -hmm. You're in your downstairs brain. This isn't going well. Let's, you know, round up at the kitchen table in 30 minutes. I'm going to go move my body. You that's know. a, that's great. And I think actually that's great modeling for your kids to say, you know what, I'm not feeling calm. Mm -hmm. So let's have this conversation in the morning. Let's both think about it. And we can, we can come back to this conversation in the morning. Yeah. And then they know that if they're out of control, they can say the same thing. You know what? I don't feel like I'm going to, this isn't going to go well if I try to solve this with you right now. Yeah. My stepdad always said, wear it around, wear it around. And so I do that with a lot of things because, you know, our first reaction sometimes to things is not pretty. <laughs> so I wear a lot of things around. Um, lastly, you, so we have seen again, you know, prior to the pandemic, we were seeing some behaviors, some mental health issues from kids, even suicide, even as young as 10 to 14. Yeah. You wrote, I don't know what year that was, but you wrote one of the most tactical, practical, tangible, beautiful articles about that topic and everything that might lead a student up to that decision. Um, so just, you know, as a last question for you, um, what, what, how do we lower the blood pressure on that conversation for this age student and parents and caregivers, of, because it's a scary word. It's a scary topic. There's still a lot of stigma around it, but we're still seeing an increase in it in some areas of the country. And just, you know, the last couple of years, especially through the pandemic, just locally, Phoenix Children's Hospital has sounded the alarm that they're seeing more and more kids age five to 11 wow. in our ERs. And then we have the Surgeon General report as well. So can you speak just to kind of overall topic of that and maybe just some key things to think about as we try to get in front of that? Yeah, and, and again, I think that as caregivers, it's important to let them know that you're not always feeling 100% and to cope out loud, to tell them what you're going to do to feel better and then do it and then come back and report how you feel after maybe calling a really good friend or getting some exercise, whatever it is you try. And I think it's also really important, especially in this age group when, first of all, they don't have a good sense of what's going on in their internal life. Second of all, uh, half of suicides in this age group are based on impulsivity, not depression. And so what we want to be, and third of all, they're not good at asking for help. And when they do, usually they're asking a similarly impaired seventh grader instead of a trained adult. And they want to be good people. They want to support their friends. So I would have a conversation with them that has two parts. The first is talking about when it's a child's issue versus an adult's issue. So let's say your friend comes to you and they tell you that they are thinking about hurting themselves. It Not only are you not 
equipped to help them, but maybe even a normal adult wouldn't be able to help them. Maybe they need a trained professional and you actually might be getting in their way instead of trying to help them yourself, be that bridge, help them get that adult support. And then the second piece of it is to ask your child while they're calm, when there isn't a crisis, who is the adult that you would go to for help if you were in a crisis situation? And be clear, it doesn't have to be you, the parent, because what you're doing when you have that conversation is number one, you're helping them think through who they would ask when they're not in a crisis. Number two, you're normalizing that help seeking behavior. And number three, if they don't have someone in, in mind, it's an opportunity to have a conversation. Maybe it's that a, an older cousin or a really nurturing neighbor or their school counselor it could be anybody in their life, but you wanna make sure that there's somebody in the back of their mind who they would call in that crisis. Oh my gosh, so much goodness. So I will find that article and link it in the link to this YouTube video because it's just excellent. So I'm going to invite Edie and Michelle to come back on because I want them to speak to resources at the schools themselves. I know they have um, school guidance counselors. Some of the schools have social workers and Edie oversees that whole department. So I'm going to invite them to come back. And then um, just to reiterate that um, your book is called Middle School Matters. And then could you tell us like how to find you? Where are you? How do we follow you? All of the goodness. Sure, I'm most active on Twitter and it's at P Fagel, F-A-G-E-L-L. -L. And I have a website, phyllisfagel.com where you can find there are lots and lots of articles that I've written over the years. And Middle School Matters is available anywhere books are sold. Awesome. So it looks like Edie's back on and I'm just waiting for Michelle to get into the waiting room. So Edie, um, thanks again for being here tonight and hosting both of us. Um, could you just speak to resources um, at specifically at that fifth through eighth grade level, both academic and social emotional supports? Absolutely. And thank you so much. This is a really interesting conversation. And I'm so glad for all of this information. So just to share out at all of our Madison middle schools, all of our schools have both a social worker and counselor who's on site and available to provide support for all students. And they really help lead a lot of the social emotional learning work that we're doing as a district. If you look at our district strategic plan, we also have a lot of information there just in terms of our work towards really supporting the whole child. So this isn't just work with a social worker or with a counselor, but it's work we're doing day in and day out in our classrooms and through our deep commitment to social and emotional learning. Awesome. And it looks like Michelle's popping back in as well. There she is. Hi. Hi. Did yeah. you add anything? I'm going to pop over onto the Slido and see if there's any questions while you're doing that. Yeah, I think your question, because I was toggling between the two. So I think what, um, Katie, what you were asking is, you know, what kind of resources do we have at our schools um, to support our students? And I didn't know, um, Edie, if you wanted to talk about our counselors and social workers, if you want to um, talk about that a little bit. Sure, so I just shared that all of our schools have both a social worker counselor, but I also shared that the commitment is not just through that social worker counselor that's available for all students. It's through the work we do as a district through social emotional learning that's embedded in all of our practices. And it's a real priority of the district for the, or as part of our strategic plan. Oh, thank you. Phyllis, are you still here? Because I wanted to see if we could ask you a question. Yes. A lot of times we get this, this question from parents and, um, and um, they often ask like, and as a parent, I felt this, and now I, I was reflecting because I'm a grandparent and I, I'm still thinking the same question. So if there is like just one or two things that a parent can do to make this transition really successful from middle school, I mean, from elementary school to middle school, what are the few things that they can do um, that will be the, that will make this transition the most successful. If you were get, kind of distilling it down, the, these more, we, these morsels tonight are really helpful. You know, I think that one of them is to acknowledge that 
their child probably is hearing that negative rhetoric. All middle schoolers have seen Mean Girls and they, many of them go into it assuming that suddenly overnight kids are going to be mean and problem seeking and it's just gonna be just a horrible socially combative experience. And I think the more we can do to message it in a positive way and to make sure that we're not maligning that whole phase, which is actually, it's not true anyway. I, I think middle schoolers are really empathetic. Of course, they're making mistakes in their learning and it's a really challenging time because there's so much change, but to talk about it in a positive way and to really emphasize the things that they can look forward to, maybe talk about the classes they're going to take, maybe help them meet a few kids before school starts. If they're anxious, they might need to meet an administrator or a counselor before they go over or tour the school or maybe go see a, a play that is happening or a musical or chorus concert, any sporting event, anything that would give them some more familiarity, especially if they're a little bit nervous. I was just checking to see if we had any questions. So just as a reminder, um, we're using an app and a website. So it's the same thing, slido.com. So S-L-I period D-O dot com. Um, you can just anonymously or with your name text in any questions that you may have. Um, I don't currently see any questions as of right now, um, but I'm going to give you a question from our last session because it okay. does relate to this. Um, when should I think about giving my child their first phone? It's not so, loaded or anything. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an issue that comes up in my school all of the time. There's always uh, somebody who wants to spearhead, you know, a group initiative to delay giving the phones. And one of the things I think it's important to remember is that there can be equity issues involved. If you are, let's say, a single parent and your child is taking public transportation and they need to be able to reach you, they might need to have a phone. So I think I, I, I do want to caution against any kind of universal applies to everybody message. The second piece of it is it's not about the grade, it's about your child's maturity and readiness. I personally would delay a little bit if you can, if there isn't one of those situations where it's a necessity, because once they get go down that road, it starts to detract from their time that they spend face to face. And we do want them developing those skills for as long as possible. And until they have the ability to really interpret feedback in person, they're certainly not going to have an easy time doing it online without all of those cues. So you will get all kinds of arguments from your child that they must have it or they will have no social life. There are intermediary steps, you know, that might be an iPad. It could be an access to texting in some other way. And I do think that there's a difference between texting and social media. And you want to make sure that you are following all of the guidelines. A lot of the apps don't allow you to have your child on until age 13. And it's really hard to go back, even though, of course, you set the rules. The second you open that box, they're going to find ways around it. We talked about lying. They are going to find ways to take that app off their phone and then put it back on when they're ready to have it and you're not holding their phone. So if you can delay, I do recommend it. With my own kids, I feel like it's been a slippery slope. The first one, it was eighth grade. The second one, it was seventh grade. And then of course the pandemic hit when my third kid was in sixth grade. And so they got one in sixth grade. And if I could do it over again, I, I wish, obviously the pandemic happened, but I, I wish I could have held out until seventh grade at least with him because my eighth grader, who, the one who got in eighth grade, who's now a sophomore in college says the best thing that ever happened to him that I did for him. And believe me, he did not feel this way at the time is that I did not allow him on social media until high school because he looks back now and says he was spared so much drama that he would not have been able to manage at the time. Yes, there is a national movement. If anybody's interested in looking into it, it's called wait until eighth. Um, it's, it was a grassroots movement that started with some mothers in um, Atlanta, Georgia area. Um, and it's a, now a national movement, meaning wait until eighth grade to give a phone, not social media, like to give an actual device. Um, so, you know, in my circles, when I'm out speaking, I talk about like, you don't have to give it. You can band together as a village and say, we as a friendship group of parents 
and caregivers are really going to try to stave this off as long as possible, right? Knowing that as they transition to high school, most private and public and charter high schools um, do allow phones at some level and or using them in the classroom and in most of our public schools, at least in Arizona, um, almost require or have them in the classrooms being used as tools. So it's it's a little bit of a double bind sometimes. So um, I don't see any active questions right now. Um, Michelle and Edie, did you have any other resources that you wanted to offer? I know you all are about 21 hours, 18 hours, 16 hours away from spring break. So that's <laughs> got to be a great feeling. Um, but any parting messages um, for this or for the audience or any of that? I think we wanted to close up, especially for thanking Phyllis for joining us um, and Katie for you for bringing her to us. This has been an excellent program this evening and we thank those who have joined us live this evening and those who will watch us later on. We really appreciate our community for um, for logging in and watching us on YouTube and we're always really open to additional um, additional topics for our coming year as we'll be working on our programming. We're halfway through this year's um, season and for Thrive. And just for those who um, are wondering what Thrive stands for, we put it together, <clears throat> excuse me, and it stands for Together, Healthy, Resilient, Informed, Values Aligned and Empowered. And as we close up, um, this is our third of a six part series and our next series, just so we're looking ahead, we've got another one this month, month after spring break on that Thursday on March 24th at 6.30 PM. That's the middle school to high school transition. Katie, do you wanna give a little foreshadow of who's gonna be on our guest panel? Yeah, we have um, several members of the freshman transition team from Phoenix Union High School District are going to be joining us. And then Katie Clark, who is one of Madison's wonderful middle school principals. So we'll have middle school person, couple high school people, and really talking about that bridge and that transition. And again, kind of these same types of questions about strategies and front loading and relaxing summer and all of those great things um, that we have to look forward to. Yeah, that's that should be really excellent. And Katie was also Katie Clark was also a high school administrator. So um, I think that that's a great option for the panel. Um, also, I just wanted to look ahead too. We've got one coming up on April 7th. For those of you who are interested, that's on vaping and substance abuse experimentation. We have Shane Watson coming from Not My Kid. I've seen him present and I've seen Not My Kid present multiple times. I learn something every single time. I'm, um, I'm, I always think I know a lot on, the, on, on vaping and I'm still continuing to learn quite a bit. So we're looking forward to having Shane uh, Watson come that night, uh, April 7th, for those of you who are or, um, please put that on your calendar. And we close up on May 12th. And that last session is all about summer and amplifying your mental health. And we have guest Travis Webb from Travis Webb Therapy joining us um, to close out on May 12th. And then we'll start all again um, preparing for next year. And as I said, um, Ms. Dolan and I are both really open to receiving ideas for the coming year and, um, and putting our programming together to serve the Madison community. Um, Edie, do you want to say anything before we close up tonight? No, I just want to thank everyone again. And I just want to remind families that we are here as a resource. So whether it's through this Thrive series, whether it's through our podcast, or whether it's through contacting your schools directly, we're here to support your child. So please don't hesitate to reach out, whether it's to the social worker, counselor, anyone else in a building. We're all invested in the social, emotional health and wellness of students. And we're in this together. So we'd love to hear more information on how we can support you and your student. Well, thanks, Phyllis, for staying up late for us. Um, Phyllis is all the way across the country in Washington, D.C., so um, it's time for her to go to bed. <laughs> go home. She's actually still at school, so <laughs> have her drive actually home to go to bed. Um, but thanks again, Phyllis. You're awesome. Thanks for being with us here tonight. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Well, thank you, everyone. That concludes our program for tonight. We look forward to seeing everybody after spring break again on March 24th. Have a good evening.